open up your Bibles to Psalm 99. Psalm 99, my message is entitled, Knowing This Holy God. Knowing This Holy God, Psalm 99, two verses, verses 5 and 9. So let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. Psalm 99, beginning with verse number 5. Notice what the psalmist says. He says, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Drop down to verse 9. Again he says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. That hill or mountain stands for his kingdom. For the Lord our God is holy, knowing this holy God. Heavenly Father, as we consider this subject, Lord, I know I'm but a fallible man. But dear God in heaven, I pray that you'd anoint this message, that you'd open up the eyes of our understanding, that we could get a glimpse of the heavenly vision. And Father, we could understand something about your holiness. Be with us, we pray. Fill this house with your spirit, with your presence, with your glory, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, beloved, we use the word holy so casually and cavalierly today, don't we? For example, we say things like holy cow or holy mackerel or when I was growing up, holy moly or holy Toledo. Do you know where that word holy Toledo came from? Of course, Toledo was in in Ohio. During the days of prohibition, when the bootleggers were selling booze all over the place, they couldn't stop them from selling the booze in Ohio, so the authorities said, look it, we'll give you a sanctuary city. If you don't come here on, uh, if you don't sell booze in our city, we'll let you come here as a sanctuary on Sunday, and we won't arrest you. <laughs> so that's where we got the, the expression, Holy Toledo, from. Also, by the way, did you know where we get the expression, Holy Mackerel, from? You see, the fishermen used to go out and fish on a Saturday. Everybody went to church on a Sunday, and you couldn't sell your mackerel then, and they knew it wouldn't last till Monday. Now, people were in church on Sunday. So what happened was the vendors started going out, and when Sunday, when the people were out of church, they had their little carts right there, and they would sell them the fish because there was no refrigeration. So they said, we're going to call this from now on holy mackerel. (laughs) So that's where we get the expression holy mackerel. Excuse me. But, beloved, even in the church, in in the world, beloved, The word holy is casually used and carelessly used. For example, we call an overzealous people and worshipers. Many times we've heard people call them holy rollers. And beloved, when someone seems to be either judgmental or critical, we call them holier than thou. And beloved, also when a child in the ballroom, uh, excuse me, the nursery, uh, a child in there has a temper tramp, tantrum. What do we say? That child is, is uh, called a holy terror. <laughs> if I worked in that nursery, I'll tell you right now, I'd be in jail and the kids would be all tied up and gagged. <laughs> Nevertheless, beloved, no matter how we use that word holy, no matter how much it's misused and abused, both folks, by ch- folks in the church and society, the word holy is indeed a biblical word. It's a word that is used consistently to describe God. If you were to ask the average Christian today, what is the preeminent feature, the preeminent and foremost attribute of God, you'd get something like this. Some would say, well, it's his love. Some would say it's his mercy. Some would say it's his grace or wisdom. Others would say it's his truth. But right at the end of the list, most Christians would say it's his holiness. Now listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible refers to God's holiness more than any other attribute found throughout Scripture. Would you say amen? Oh, listen to me. Sure, God is all-loving. 
But the angelic host around his throne do not sing day and night. God is love, love, love. And sure, we know God is graceful. And we thank God that was saved by grace. But the angelic host around his throne do not sing day and night. God is grace, 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 or mercy, mercy, mercy. And sure, we know that God is omniscient. And he knows everything. But the angelic host that sits around his throne do not sing day and night. God is all-knowing. He is omniscient. He is omniscient. Nor, beloved, do the angelic host sing that God is omnipotent and uh, uh, all-powerful day and night, beloved. And we know that he is. They sing constantly and continuously. They use that word holy in the superlative 24-7. God is holy, holy, holy. Now that's a powerful statement by angelic witnesses. Would you say amen out there? Now I want you to look at verses 5 and 9. The Bible says, Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Verse 9, Exalt the Lord our God, and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Now twice the psalmist uses this Hebrew word, kadosh, and that means holy, meaning he alone is personally, that he alone is morally and spiritually that he alone is ethically unique and intrinsically pure and sacred and set apart from every other being in the universe. Would you say amen? Meaning that there's none other like him, beloved, that could even be compared to him. In the fifth gospel in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, God says this, listen, For thus saith the High and Holy One that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit. Why do you do it, Lord? To revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so therefore all believers should be busy about the business of trying to get to know this holy God. You hear me now, he alone is our great God and the Holy One that we worship, and he is the sovereign king of the universe, and there's none other. Would you say amen out there? Oh, God says, I want you to get to know me. Get to know my holiness. Get to know all about me. Well, beloved, there's three things I want to show you. First of all, examining the holiness of God. Examining the holiness of God. I'm not going to bring you a lot of scriptures today. I'm just going to preach to you. You see, beloved, I told you that God is called holy more than any other thing in Scripture. Repeatedly, the Scripture refers to Him as the Holy One of Israel. Or it refers to Him as the Holy One. And what's amazing to me is Christians will sing hymns about God's holiness, but I just wonder, I just wonder how many folks really understand what we're singing about, what it means. What does the Bible mean? when it says that God is holy. Well, basically, it means two primary and distinct things, beloved. God's holiness refers to his distinct moral and spiritual and ethical, number one, separateness. Separateness. And number two, God's holiness refers to his more distinctive moral and spiritual and ethical sinlessness. His sinlessness. Now, let's talk about these a second. First, God's holiness is his separateness, meaning this, meaning that God is totally other than us. He's totally different. He's totally unique. He's separate and set apart from everything and everyone. You see, folks, he alone is a special and a supernatural uh, being in a class of his own, and there's none other on the top side of this earth or throughout the universe who can ever be compared with him. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Timothy 6.16. He says, Who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. Now, folks, God is an unapproachable God. You just can't walk up to God someday and say, Hi, God, how you doing? God is an unapproachable God except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me in John 14, 6. So this speaks of his complete otherness, his complete unlikeness. 
in Hosea 1.9, God said this. Now, this is what God said. He said, I am God and not a man, the Holy One. And he drives it home, beloved, in the midst of thee. I'm not the unholy one in the midst of thee. I'm not someone who's just like you in the middle of you. I am the absolute Holy One, the Holy Being in the universe who's in the midst of you. Come on and say amen. So that's what he's talking about there, ladies and gentlemen. You listen to me. The Bible tells us over and over again, it says things like this, that God is not a man that he should not lie. A God is not a man that he should repent. A God is not a man that he should change. You see, beloved, this notes that this immutable God is saying that he is not a fallen or feeble member of the human race or family, but his absolute deity, and he's far above the human beings. He's far above the human race. We do not believe in pantheism, that is, that God is in everything, or panentheism, that God is everything. You see, beloved, that's not what the Bible teaches. God is far above his creatures. And we need to understand that because those two things that were heresies have crept into the church in the last days. You see, beloved, he's the supernatural creator of the human family, of the universe, of everything on this earth. He is the only uncreated, and the Bible says, uncaused cause in the universe. He is the only one and only divine being in existence that has no beginning and no end. And when I dwell on that, that absolutely staggers my mind. Because everything that I know through my tactile senses and through my wisdom or intelligence that God has given me has a beginning and has an end, except for the God whom I worship. The holy God, knowing this holy God, would you say amen out there? And the Bible teaches, beloved, that he is the omnipotent and almighty creator, and he's the originator of everyone and everything, and that he is set apart from and far above his creation and his creatures that he made. And so he alone is the separate and unique supernatural and divine being who always existed, imagine, always existed in perfect morality, perfect spirituality, perfect ethics, only being that ever did any morality or spirituality or ethics that man may have or integrity, it comes from God. And so this holy God, you see, beloved, he's saying that there is no one else like him, that there is no one who can be compared to him, that there's no one who can match or be likened unto him who always existed in the dateless, timeless, eternal past, present, and future, beloved. There has never been a time when God has ceased to be or shall ever cease to be. Would you say amen? He says, I am the Holy One, the Eternal God, the Holy One, the Eternal God, over and over and over again, setting the nail in our hearts and in our mind and our soul, trying to drive that profound truth home so we'll finally get it. You hear me now? It is not safe to approach God irreverently. You listen to me. It is not safe to approach God disrespectfully or flippantly. He cannot be trifled with, though a lot of people try to do it. He cannot be messed with. He cannot be joked or toyed with, beloved, but must be approached and treated with a serious and somber and soul, uh, sober manner, beloved, uh, because of the unique and holy being that he truly is. You see, what I'm saying is this. He will allow no one to treat him with scorn and contempt, though people try to do it. And beloved, listen to me. People drop dead all over the place. People have all kinds of accidents. All kinds of wrong things go in their life. And you know what? A lot of it's caused from God judging them. God cursing them because they've cursed him. God will not allow anyone to scorn him or to curse him and walk away scot-free. Now, he'll give them a period of grace, ladies and gentlemen, to think you're right with God, but God only knows the line that they will cross, that he is drawn, and then ultimately he will deal with them. Amen? You see, he'll allow no one to ever challenge or defy him. He'll allow no one to contaminate him with their sin. He'll allow no one to impugn his holy character. 
He'll allow no one to blaspheme his holy name. Beloved, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's what the third commandment says. And God says he'll allow no one to approach him or come into his holy presence except through faith in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved. Why? Because he's the ultimate and supreme one. He's the perfect one. He's the separated one. He's separated from all of that. All of the gods of the heathens who were idols, they believed that their God was so transcendent that they had to worship the idol. Our God is a God who not only is transcendent, the heaven of heavens can't contain him, but the Bible says he is a God who is also imminent. He's near. Amen? He's not to be worshipped through sticks or stones or idols or statues. He is a God that is to be worshipped on your knees or standing up with reverence and respect for who he is, the Holy One of Israel. Would you say amen out there? So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying the Holy God or this Holy God is not safe, but he is good. Beloved, I'm saying this holy God is not safe, but he is merciful. This holy God is not safe, but he is trustworthy and he's forgiven to all of those who will place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And now they will approach him very, very reverently, not disrespectfully in their life, not flippantly in their life, but with great reverence for who he is. I mean, we see people bowing down before kings or even the pope. Can you imagine the holy God who's brighter than the sun? How holy, holy, holy this God really is. That even the angels bow down before him. You see, beloved, we're to understand that we worship him in reverence and respect for his greatness and for his glory, and for his grandeur, and for his goodness, and for his grace. A God like this did not have to save anyone. He did not have to send his son. But through grace he did. So number one, God's holiness is his separateness. Number two, God's holiness is his sinlessness. Let me say that again. God's holiness is his sinlessness. Now, beloved, this conveys the idea of absolute moral and spiritual and ethical, now listen to me, pristine purity and perfection. I want you to listen to what John said to the people who he was writing to in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. John says this, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, what's he saying? In other words, holiness means the total absence of any taint, spot, or blot, or evil in God. Any taint, spot, or blot of wickedness in God. Any taint, spot, or blot of sinfulness in God, beloved. In other words, John's saying there's no flaws, there's no faults, there's no defects at all in his person, at all in his being, at all in his word or will or ways. Now, we don't like that sometimes. And the reason we don't like it is because our will often conflicts with God's will. And we many times misinterpret our will for God's will because our will is so strong it drowns out that still small voice of God. Amen? God is saying, there's no defect in my will. There's no flaw at all in my word. Make, be, make sure you know that. There's no flaws in me. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, it says of God. Now imagine, if you ever read the book of Habakkuk, he has a real encounter with God, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But he says this in Habakkuk 1.13. He says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. In other words, he's saying when God looks down, unless you're in Christ, he's like, and he looks at a sinner, or looks away from a sinner. Can you imagine that? We think we're pretty good. Uh, we measure ourselves according to ourselves, and the Bible says that's not wise to do, by the way. We compare ourselves with other people. I'm not like that drunk in the street, and I'm not like that person who's always lying and cheating and fornicating. God says, how much are you like Jesus? He is absolute, pure glory and holiness. Would you say amen? 
He is the wisdom of God, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He is the glory of God. You see, beloved, we can't approach God like that. We just can't come into God's presence. It must be co- our sin must be covered and cleansed through the sinless and shameless and guiltless and blameless. And I always pray that, Derek and I pray it, okay? Blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, or you'll be cast out of his sight into the lake of fire forever and ever. Now, God does not want that. And he warns men against that. But if we don't come to Christ, that's the fate that awaits us. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying we've examined the holiness of God. And beloved, if someone ever ever asks you, what does the holiness of God mean then you can answer them in these two ways. God's holiness means, number one, His separateness. And number two, God's holiness means His sinlessness. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, He's the originator. He's the maker of all life. And His intrinsic, I mean, what He's made up of, if I can use that word, His intrinsic moral and spiritual and ethical character and nature and attributes are impeccable and they are immutable. They are unsullied and unspotted by even one scintilla and speck or stain of sin. When the psalmist thought on this, he said this in Psalm 103.1. Beloved, he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Would you say amen? When he dwelt on the holiness of God, the holy name of God, the holy mountain of God, the holy hill of God, the holy angels of God, he said, Oh, oh bless my soul and all that is within me. My soul, my spirit, my being, my world my mentality, my emotions, all of that. Bless His holy name, not my holy name, not the President's holy name, not your holy name. Bless the Lord's holy name, oh my soul. Oh my soul is what he's saying. You see, beloved, this refrain that God's name is holy, and just look it up over and over and over again. The refrain is repeatedly used throughout the Bible. And remember, the Bible is God's love letter to us. It is God trying to reveal to us something about Himself. And we live in an unholy world, and many times we read the Scriptures through unholy eyes, or through our fallen lives, or through our circumstances, instead of looking at it objectively and exegetically the way God meant it to be looked at. Then we can apply it eisegetically and subjectively to our own lives. Would you say amen? So that was point number one, examining the holiness of God, His separateness and His sin, uh, sinlessness. Number two, encountering the holiness of God. You know, the Bible speaks of some people who suddenly and unexpectedly met the Holy One of Israel. They met this holy God. The question is this, let me ask you this. How would you react if this holy God were to suddenly break forth in your life and make himself visible and known to you today? How would you react? Beloved, how would you respond if you ever encountered the personal holiness of God? How do you think you'd endure having a sudden, surprising confrontation with God's holiness? The Bible is literally filled with people whom this happened to. People like kings. People like beggars, people like prophets and priests, people like prostitutes and thieves, people like warriors and weaklings and and people like merchants, ladies and gentlemen. But you know, as I go over this and I've read the scripture again and again and I study their lives, what's so unbelievable, remarkable to me is this, is that when they suddenly encountered God's holiness, all of them reacted in the same and similar way. They all did. They all reacted in the same and similar way. Beloved, they didn't say, oh, like the charismatic said, I saw God in all of his glory today, and I sat down with him, and we just talked. It was so beautiful. I couldn't see his face, but he was so... They didn't act like that. You see, man has tried to bring God down to his level, right? And God says, through all of his prophets, people who do that speak through their own imaginations, their own visions, their own dreams, and they're false prophets who lie to you. They're false prophets who lie to you, who do this. 
And it's amazing to me how so little discernment people have today because we existentially, experientially, want to have an encounter with God. We all do, but I want to tell you, it will never be like that. If you have one, you won't have one like that. You listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. How did they react in the same way? They trembled. The Bible says that they quaked. The Bible says that they cowered, that they cringed in dread and fear. Beloved, as you read it, some of them fell down on their face as dead men. And the Bible said it took their breath away. <gasps> Boom! Down they went. The Bible says some of them went mute and could not speak. God himself asked Gabriel to touch Daniel on the back, to get him up off his face so he could speak. Beloved, some of them were so filled with terror and fright that they were convinced that they'd now die and they'd be condemned and they'd go to hell. Because now they're seeing themselves in light of a holy God. And they're seeing something about their own fallenness and sinfulness and unholiness, no matter how righteous they think they are. You see, it's a scary and terrifying indeed to be able to have an encounter with a supernatural and holy being like God. So what I want to do for a few minutes is I want to take you on a little trip through the Bible and tell you about a few people who suddenly and unexpectedly met the holiness of God. It wasn't something they planned to do. It wasn't something they said, you know what I'm going to do? I, I, I'm going to meditate today and I'm going to envision Christ in my mind and I'm going to see what he looks like. Uh-uh, beloved. I've had several supernatural experiences in my life. I didn't seek any of them. Most of them happened when I was, my feet were so deep into the fire and I had to take a stand and everybody was against me. And they didn't understand the issue and there's no way you could defend it. And then God showed up. And I can remember one time, beloved, and this is a true story. I was walking the, on the water. It was low tide and God showed up and I fell. I had my tie on like this. I had my pants rolled up and I fell and I started crawling. I mean, it was like the power, the strength, the air went out of me. And I, like Dwight L. Moody, said, stay thy hand, Lord. I'm trying to get up out of the water line because the tide's coming in. And I crawled up with my clothes on, and I rolled on my back, and I just, oh, God, oh, God. And then from that moment, beloved, he gave me peace, even though I was terrified, and then he started delivering me. And he started showing me, Joel, just like I said to the prophets of old, don't look on their faces, don't worry about what they're saying. You just do what I tell you to do. Now, I didn't seek that, but God said, Joel, you need that to be able to have some more courage, <laughs> okay? Beloved, it's hard. It's hard taking a stand for what is right, especially amongst God's people. When they come into the house of God, most of them want what, uh, they, want what they want to hear. They don't want what they need to hear. See, but the preacher's job is to bring you up to God's level, not keep you down where you are. And so it's not because the preacher hates you or God hates you. It's because he wants you to see what he's like. So there were people in the Bible who encountered God. For example, beloved Moses encountered this holy God. Moses had several extraordinary encounters with this God. And when he did, these moments utterly changed his life. Now, you know the story. Once when Moses was tending his own flock in Midian, and he was minding his own business, by the way, it was a bush that was on fire on Mount Horeb. And Moses looked at that bush, but it wasn't being consumed. And when he went to investigate, beloved, this great sight, suddenly God spoke to him out of that burning bush. And this is what he said in Exodus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. You can see Moses is kind of ditty bopping up there. God says, Moses, Moses. And Moses kind of cringed. And he says, here am I. And then the Lord said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the, plan where, uh, the ground wherein thou standest is holy ground. Moses, you're going to come into my presence. You're going to show me reverence. You're going to show me respect. You're going to take off your shoes, almost like they do in Japan today. You, know, you, take, you will do that. Oh, beloved, listen to me. There was nothing sacred or holy about the ground that Moses was walking on. There was nothing inherently holy about that. What made that ground so holy, what made that place so holy, was that the presence of God had now come down upon it. And when God come down upon something, everything around it now becomes holy. 
Would you say amen out there? That's what happened to all the vessels in the temple, if you'll recall. And so, beloved, what I'm saying to you is this here. Moses was not the same man from then on. Later on, we see Moses. He has another amazing and extraordinary encounter with God when he ascended to Mount Sinai to receive the law of God. Remember the two, uh, two tables with the Ten Commandments on it, the tables of stone. And Moses was saying to God, Lord, I want you to come with us into the promised land. God says, there's no way, Moses. These people are stiff-necked. These people are rebellious. They won't listen to anything that I've said. Even though I've done miracles before them, they still have their own will. And Moses said, oh God, oh God, at least let me see your glory. And then he said in Exodus 33, 18, listen, he said, Lord, I beseech thee. Now you can see, I beg with you, Lord. I plead with you, Lord. Let me see your glory slash holiness. That's a synonym. Well, beloved, now we know that no man can see God in all his glory without first being glorified and live to tell about it. The Bible teaches that very clear. But God did indeed give him a glimpse of his glory. He said to Moses, Moses, this is what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to take you and put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to have you turn around. I'm going to put my hand to cover you, shield you. Then I'm going to go by you and let you see my back parts, not my front parts or my face, or you'll never live. So God takes Moses, puts him in the cleft of the rock, covers him with his hand, and he walks by and he recites all of his glorious attributes. I am the Lord thy God, the most merciful, the kind, the loving, the, the Holy One of Israel. And so when he gets through, beloved, God removes his hand and goes away. The Bible says Moses then comes down the mountain after that encounter with the law of God in his hands. But when the children of Israel saw him, they were shocked. They were frightened. Why, beloved? Because they saw the skin of his face. It was now aglow and shining with the bright light of God's reflected and refracted glory of his holiness, beloved. And the Bible says it was like horns of light, beams, rays of light that were shooting off of his face. And they said, Moses, Moses, don't come near us. Cover thy face. And so they wouldn't even come into the presence of Moses. Moses first had to cover his face with a veil. And all Moses got a glimpse was, was the back parts of God's glory and holiness. Can you imagine that, beloved? So he had to cover his face with a veil. Well, another person who encountered the holiness of God was Job. And, beloved, we all know the story. Job encountered the holy God. You see, Job was a holy, righteous, and godly man. And we know that he was extremely wealthy, beloved. But God allowed Satan in a series of devastating attacks to afflict Job and to afflict his family. And within a few days, Job lost all of his children, all of his wealth, all of his stock, all of his friends, all of his reputation as a respected leader in the community. And not only that, beloved, think about this. Can you imagine he had ten children? In one day, Job had to attend the funeral of his own. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying next time you're having a bad day, bad day, I want you to read Job 1 through 3. And when you do, it'll put your piddly little problem in perspective, and I guarantee you, you'll feel a lot better. Guarantee it. You just got to look that, read it over, beloved, and see what happens. Well, anyways, what am I saying to you? I'm saying Job, after fa failing to understand his affliction and failing to receive any encouragement from his friends, whom he said, by the way, were miserable comforters. A lot of people are holier than thou. Well, he's suffering, so he must be a real sinner. Does God allow holy, holy, holy sinners? God allow holy people to suffer? Do you allow Paul to suffer? Do you allow Isaiah to suffer? Do you allow the prophets to suffer? Oh, beloved, it takes discernment to understand what God is doing in the person's life. So Joe said, you, you guys are nothing but miserable comforters to me. In other words, in Vietnamese, he said, Didi Mao, get out of here. <laughs> so God finally comes to Job and he confronts him. And beloved, he confronts him in Job chapters 38 right through to 42. And God reproves Job for his misunderstanding of him. But you know what God does then? God then takes Job on a virtual tour of all of the scientific principles 
of his work as creator of everything, beloved, and he speaks to him about some things specifically. In other words, God points out to him his wonders of geology. He starts telling, where were you when I made the rocks? And he speaks to him about his wonders of meteorology, Pleiades and Orion, Orion. And he speaks to him about uh, things like oceanography and astronomy and zoology, how he made Leviathan and all these different animals. And you can just see Job. I mean, we think we know a lot. We know nothing, ladies and gentlemen. And I wish, I wish, in all honesty, people could not Google information over the Internet. Most of that is anecdotal. It is not scientific. You know what I think? People have said this, and they'll repeat what somebody has said, and someone else has said, someone else has said, someone else has said, and somebody else tries it, and they almost get killed. It's stupid. You know, if you'll do this, and uh, uh, it'll revolutionize your life. If you'll take some mud and mix it with apple cider vinegar, you'll feel great. Just do it for two weeks. Two weeks later, the person, ah, ah, I told you to lose 20 pounds. <laughs> But it's amazing. That's all anecdotal. That's like you putting your opinion. You know what worked for me? Well, I'll tell you right now, I started eating lemon peels and I never felt better. Well, before you eat lemon peels, and lemon peels are good for you, by the way, wash them. I won't go, I won't go into that any farther than that. But, beloved, so Job encounters this holy God. But then we get to Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk. He's complaining about the children of Israel. And God starts speaking to him. And he tells them that when he goes into the presence of even his creation, the trees snap. The branches will clap their hands. The mountains rock back and forth. And when God spoke to him, he said this. Listen to what Habakkuk said. He said, my voice trembled and my belly quivered and rottenness entered into my bones. When I caught a glimpse of the vision of the holiness of God, he says, my voice trembled and my belly quivered and rottenness, rottenness, stinking rottenness entered into my bones. And he was a holy prophet of God. You see, beloved, when we really experience the holiness of God and we now compare our sinful and unholy selves with him, We'd also say and do exactly what Job and Habakkuk said and did. We'd also tremble. I assure you, we'd also quiver. We'd also shake, beloved. We'd fall on our face as dead men, and we'd repent in dust and ashes before the holiness of God. Would you say amen? But you know, beloved, the most famous encounter with God was the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 tells us that in the year that King Uzziah died, he went to the temple to mourn King Uzziah, beloved. But when he got there, suddenly and unexpectedly, what happened was he caught a vision of the heavenly king. Not the dead King Uzziah, he caught a vision of the heavenly king. And he said, and I quote, I also saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, And the train of his robes, his royal robes, filled the temple. And then he said, beloved, that above the throne he also saw these angelic creatures, which we know as the seraphim. And he said they had six wings. Now listen to how he describes them. He says, with two they covered their face and homage to God, not to look directly at his holiness. Can you imagine them like this? And they're angels. God created to be around the throne. With two, they covered their feet out of reverence and respect for God, being in God's glorious presence of a holy God. And then he says, with the last two wings, they flew. But beloved, I I want you to picture this. They flew as they cried out one to the other. And this is what they said. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The Bible goes on to say that when Isaiah also saw the pillars of the temple shake at the sound of God's voice, and he saw the billowing smoke inside of the temple, beloved, that filled the room, he cried out, listen to what he said, he says, Woe unto me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Woe unto me. He saw a holy God. And God says, I want you to get to know me so you can reflect some of this holy, holiness. Would you say amen out there? 
You see, beloved, in Isaiah's day, they couldn't highlight or boldface or underline words like we do today on our computers when we want to emphasize some word or some truth, whatever it may be. Instead, what they did is they repeated a word, or they would double the word, or sometimes even triple a word. For example, when our Lord wanted to drive home an important point, He'd say something like, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you. See, what is He saying? Pay attention. This is an important, like we would boldface it, like we would underline it. So in the Bible, when they repeat something over again, I preached to you about the temple, the temple, the temple, earth, earth, earth. God was trying to drive home a point so his people could understand exactly what he was speaking about, and it was very important, and they need to listen to it. So here Isaiah says, as the seraphim are flying around, they're saying the word holy in triplicate to emphasize God's greatest attribute, that they're shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And yet their eyes are covered and their feet are covered. You can't go into the presence of a holy God, holy God beloved. You're a creature and God has to touch you first and allow you to enter into that presence. Amen? You see, beloved, what I'm saying is Isaiah was stunned when he saw this. When he saw what he was like before our holy God, and he became mentally, he became physically beloved and psychologically undone. That Hebrew word literally means he became unglued. I mean, your finite mind had never seen anything like this before. And how do you process it? You can't. How do you describe it? Many times, that's why the prophet has so many meta, uh, the, the scriptures have so many metaphors in it. Because when the prophet saw something, it was beyond the words of them to describe it. So they would use similes. It was like, it was as. It was something uh, uh, equal to. Try to explain to you and I. So what am I saying? I'm saying Isaiah encountered the holiness of God. But beloved, Paul encountered the holiness of God and we know all about that on his Damascus Road experience, beloved, when he saw the glorified Christ. And he, the Bible says he suddenly saw a bright light from heaven shining right about him, round about him. And he says it was brighter than the noonday sun, and it knocked him to the ground. His eyes were nearly burned out, and he was blinded by the presence of the glorified Christ and his holiness. And he had to be led by the hand by the men into the city of Damascus. And after three days of praying and three days of fasting, beloved, God sent his servant Ananias to heal Paul and lead him to salvation. The Bible says Ananias laid his hands on him and his physical eyes were healed and his eyes were now open. But also, then he led him to baptism and he got saved and his spiritual eyes were open. Would you say amen out there? And we know that through that encounter with the Holy One of Israel, now Saul of Tarsus becomes the great Apostle Paul. Would you say amen? Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, how much this must have rocked him to his core? To change everything that he had learned up to that point in time, beloved, that Judaism was the only way, everything else was heresy, but God showed up in his life, like he may in yours sometimes. Oh, beloved, not only Paul, but John encountered the holiness of God. The Bible says the apostle John had been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Now, the Isle of Patmos was in the Aegean Sea, beloved, and it was a Roman penal colony. And the Bible says that John was there for preaching the word of God and for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would not back down in front of the Roman authorities or anyone else. This is the way it is. You do it to me whatever you have to do. And he's an older man, beloved. He's in his 90s right now. And they exile him to the Isle of Patmos, a rocky, barren island. There's no McDonald's, no Wendy's, no hotels there, no place you can get food. To imagine trying to survive on a rocky, barren island at 95 years of age. So John says, I'd rather die believing in my Jesus than whatever you can ever do to me. In Revelation 1, he said this. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, 
He was praying when suddenly he too saw a vision of the glorified Christ. And beloved, then he goes on and describes him. He says he was clothed with a long, bright white robe down to his feet with a golden sash wrapped around his waist. In other words, he was the great high priest. That's what the high priest wore around his waist. And he says his head and his hair were like the whitest wool and snow ever before seen. Now, I, I can remember years ago when I lived in Kava, there wasn't too many people in, the, in them days living in Kava. And you'd go through these cornfields, beloved, that had been mowed down, and the snow was so bright, you get snow blinded. You had to put gla- sunglasses on. Have anybody ever had snow blindness before? You know what I'm talking Imagine, John says, I never saw wool so bright. I never saw snow so bright ever uh, that white before. And then, beloved, not only that, he says, and his eyes flash like flames of fire. See, these are the eyes that are going to judge us in the day of judgment. They're going to look and burn right into our hearts. And he says his feet were like polished brass. And he says that his thunderous voice sounded like the roar of ocean waves. And out of his mouth, he said, went a two-edged sword. He says his countenance shined brighter. Brighter than the strength of the sun. Can you gaze at that sun out there? Now, can you imagine, compared to what the charismatics are saying today, they're staring at God, they're staring at Jesus. The only person, the last person to see the glorified Christ was John the Apostle, according to the Bible. I have no trust whatsoever in these people that are all claiming to see Jesus. None. And I hope you don't either. And not carried away with the dissimulation and error of the wicked. But John, after looking him over, seeing his eyes, seeing his face, seeing that double-edged sword, he said this, he says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And we know the angel literally had to pick him up. He said, I fell at his feet as dead. Well, beloved, I assure you, that we'd all react like John if we ever had a true encounter with a holy God like him. We'd all take off our shoes like Moses did. We'd all repent in dust and ashes like Job did. We'd all cry out, woe is me for I am undone, like Isaiah did. We'd all shake and tremble like Habakkuk did. We'd all be blinded and radically changed like Paul was, beloved. And we'd all fall down on our face like dead men, like John did. I'm saying when you catch a glimpse of the heavenly vision, beloved, and you see the holiness of God, it makes an incredible impact on you, and it drastically revolutionizes and transforms you, beloved, and it forever changes you. Would you say amen out there? You wouldn't just casually carry on business like a lot of these people are doing today. So we've seen about the examining the holiness of God, encountering the holiness of God, and beloved, let me give you my last quick point. And I mean it. Experiencing the holiness of God. Experiencing the holiness of God. I wonder, I just wonder how many would truly ever really like to experience the holiness of God like all of these men did. Would you? I hope so. I would too. I'd rather not know about what happened to these guys first before it happened. But I would, beloved. But what are some of the lessons we can take away from this? Well, beloved, there's the takeaway of association. In other words, seeing ourselves in the light of God's holy. Listen to me. To know this holy God, we first have to borrow and have His holy, uh, holiness given to us by His Son via the Holy Spirit. You see, we are all born as sinners with a cosmic disconnect, a detachment from God till we're born again and reconnected and re-reconciled back to Him by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's the takeaway take away of appreciation. Yes, gratitude. We must truly understand the cross at Calvary, beloved, because the cross at Calvary behind me is a graphic picture of how much God's holiness utterly hates sin. 
And so, beloved, to deal with it, he sent his only begotten, sinless son and savior uh, to die for our sins. As a graphic picture of it, beloved, he was our sacrifice, our substitute, our sin bearer to bear the penalty and the punishment of that sin. God says, I hate sin so much, I will bankrupt heaven of my greatest treasure to be able to save you. My holiness can't stand it. And so Jesus bears the curse and condemnation of the law for us. He dips his own soul in the hell, I told you, and suffers the torment of the damned. In our place, the just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty, so you and I could be saved. And so his life reflected the holiness of God. The Bible says he was a spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, beloved. And all those who place their faith in him will now get to know the holiness of God and they can go to heaven and not to hell like they are going right now apart from Christ. So that beloved, not only is there the takeaway of association, appreciation, but don't miss this. God's standard of holiness, now listen to me, is so high that when Jesus was on the cross, God turned his back on him and he could not look on his only begotten sinless son who bore the penalty of our sins. Remember, Habakkuk says, God is so pure he cannot look at evil or behold iniquity. So here's his son writhing in pain on the cross, made in the likeness of sinful men. And God goes like this to him. Turns his back on him. Now, I don't quite understand that, to be honest with you, but the Bible teaches that, amen? You see, beloved, God said, my holiness is so high that it demands that I look away from this giblet of sin and shame and sorrow. I cannot look at sin, even if it's on my own sinless son. Can't do it. That's a holy God, Amen? But, beloved, when Jesus came down from the cross, and I love this, three days later when he resurrected, he took those sin-stained garments and he now wove them into glorious robes of righteousness and holiness. And he freely gives them to you and I if we'll put our faith in him as our Lord and Savior. Would you say amen? God says, I'll exchange these for you. Just place your faith in me. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying, are you thankful for the holiness of God, beloved? Are you thankful for the cross at Calvary? Are you thankful that Jesus is your sovereign and supreme example of how we're to live a holy, righteous, and godly life? Can you see it from a divine perspective and your own human perspective? God says we're to lift you up. Lift. Listen, we come to church to lift God up, not lift ourselves up. Amen? It's amazing to me, beloved. A lot of times we sing hymns about God, but we don't praise God. We don't sing to, to God. We sing songs that we like. You see, what I'm saying to you, beloved, is that you love God enough that when you get saved, to follow Him and serve Him and say, Lord, I will do this the rest of the days of my life. Do you know this holy God? Beloved, then there's a takeaway of adoration. In other words, we ought to worship God, the Bible says, in the beauty of His holiness. The first recorded hymn in all of Scripture was written by Moses, beloved, after God destroyed Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Now you can imagine, you're on the other side of the Red Sea right now. Moses turns around, sees all the bodies floating. Chariots are gone. Horses are dead. And elation and excitement and gratitude, Moses then puts pen to parchment, and then he writes this song. He said in Exodus 15, 11, he said, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, quote, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. See, the Bible tells us that the holiness of God is very beautiful. And beloved, we're called to worship God and the beauty of his holiness. In 1 Chron Chronicles 16, 29, it puts it this way. Listen, it says, oh, worship the Lord and the beauty of his holiness. Over and over again, the Bible commands us to worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Beloved, do you see God's holiness as beautiful or something to shy away from, something to run from, run to the world, be more like the world? Or do you want to worship God in the beauty of His holiness? 
You see, there's no other way to truly know and worship this God except in the beauty of His holiness. Listen to me. Holiness is to be like God in consecration. Righteousness is to be like God in character. Godliness is to be like God in your conduct. And that is God's will for our life. Would you say amen? Then there's the takeaway of application. We ought to cultivate habits of holiness and apply it in our lives. The Bible says that God commands us, constantly and continuously commands us, to be ye holy, for I am holy. For no man without holiness will ever see God. Be ye holy. The word ye means y'all. Y'all holy. I want you all holy. Not somewhat holy. Pursuing holiness. He says, I want you to be ye holy. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, and they were real pagans at one time. But the Spirit of God got a hold of them, and he started cleaning up their life. And then Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the Spirit, quote, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Are you perfecting holiness in the fear of God in your life? I pray so, beloved, because this is how you know God. And lastly, beloved, there's the takeaway of application. I already said application, didn't I? Adoration. Now we're going to apply it. We're to look forward to the day when we'll be just as holy as God is. When Christ returns and glorifies us, Christians, beloved, then we're going to be as holy as God is. Can you imagine that? In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says it like this. Behold what manner of man... Uh, Yes, behold what manner of love, excuse me, the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Every man that has this hope in him daily is morally, spiritually, ethically purifying himself in holiness, even as God is pure. Amen? You see, beloved, in that glorious day, God is going to supernaturally touch us. And when he does, he's going to remove every stain and remnant of sin that will be left in. It will be gone forever from our bodies. And then we'll not only be perfectly holy, but praise the Lord, beloved, we'll also be impeccably beautiful. You say, how's that, Pastor Joel? How can that be? Because if God's holiness is His beauty, and it is, then this also means that when He remakes us perfect in holiness, He'll also make us beautiful like the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll have a body fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to His working, whereby He's even able to subdue all things unto Himself. Would you say amen? In other words, I'm saying we're going to be better looking than the angels. And you know what? Some of you ugly sour pusses are always walking around like this all the time like that. You're going to need it anyway. Throughout all eternity, beloved, we'll worship God as His beautiful, holy people. And when we do, we're going to echo the sentiments of the angelic host in Revelation 4, uh, uh, 4 8, beloved. They say this Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, which is yet to come. Holy, holy, holy. Imagine, we're going to say that the rest of our time in heaven. Well, beloved, may you ultimately know this holy God. Let me close with this. One day this man met Gabriel, the angel. And he said, Gabriel, how many points for good works am I going to need to be able to get in your heaven? And Gabriel told him, you'll need 100 points. The guy said, 100 points? <laughs> that ought to be easy. And the man said, okay, Gabriel, I was married and faithful to the same woman for 50 years. Gabriel said, that's great. That's three points. Three points? Only three points? He says, okay, try this out. I opened an orphanage and a home for unwed mothers 
and I funded it with my own money for 40 years. Gabriel said, marvelous, that was great. Two points. Two points? you got to be kidding me. That's got to be worth more than two points. And she says, all right, try this on for size. How about my going to church? I've been going to church faithfully for 35 years. And for 35 years, I paid my tithe and offering, and I try to serve the Lord in the church. And uh, 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 how many points is that? Gabriel said one. One point? I, that's only accumulation of six points. He says, at this rate, I'll never get into heaven by, except by the grace of God. Gabriel says, bingo, come on in. Enter thou in to the joy of the Lord. So do you know this holy God? You can't work your way to him. Every single day you must trust him and renew your faith. Knowing this holy God. Let's go to the throne of grace.